Well, thank you very much, Dean James, for the honor of being able to ask to speak today. And really, thank you to the class of 2022 for the very warm welcome. Now, think about this for a minute. You did it. It's a big accomplishment, especially given the perspective of the last couple of years. Now, I can actually remember being in your seat about 26 years ago, hoping that the speaker wasn't going to speak too long, waiting to get on with the rest of the family. But um, on one hand, I was really proud because I actually got through it and made it. But I've got to say, I was also pretty humble just thinking about all the graduates who had come before me to go on and do some pretty cool things around the world. And to the parents and the loved ones in the audience, did you ever imagine that this day would come? Now, some of you may be Wharton Legacies, and for some, this is your son or daughter, it's the first in your family to get an advanced degree. In either way, there is just no way that they could have done it without your love and your support all along the way. And I'd also really like to acknowledge the members of the faculty, the administration, without whom none of this would have been possible. I think we all realize it's been two truly extraordinary years, and they have just gone above and beyond to make your Wharton experience possible. So I want to encourage everyone to just pause for a moment and take it all in, and now let's give everyone in here another big round of applause. So I'll bet when you decided to pursue this degree, there was no way, no way of knowing that the 2022 grads would end up being forever known as Wharton's COVID class. Now, what I would tell you is that I certainly would never have imagined that I'd be Johnson & Johnson's pandemic CEO, but guess what? Here we are. We're ever, forever going to be tagged that way. But on a more serious note, I remember back in 2020, and I can still remember almost exactly where I was when I heard pneumonia outbreak in central China had claimed its first death. Things moved very quickly. You know, by the first week in February, there would be about 10,000 confirmed COVID-19 infections in China, and then the first one in the United States. Now think back to what's happened today, the world has recorded over a half a billion, think about that for a moment, you guys are good at math, a half a billion cases worldwide and a heartbreaking six million deaths around the world. And I think we would all admit that in many ways, the world's never going to be the same for us. Now in those early days, in fact very early on, much due to some hardworking people who didn't really want to ask for permission, that really said that they'd rather beg for forgiveness, they made the call to devote Johnson & Johnson's considerable ex expertise to developing a vaccine. And what I can tell you two years on, that I have never, ever experienced such a rapid pace of scientific, engineering, political, and organizational challenges which just hit me all at once. It was like drinking from a fire hose. The ambiguity, well, it came daily and took place alongside an unending barrage of scrutiny. And it was really at this same uncertain moment that you made the decision to enroll in Wharton. And you had no idea how radically different your MBA experience would be from every other class before you. And you did it all, facing fear and grief as the virus affected our families, friends, and colleagues. And it's fair to say that none of us None of us have ever experienced anything quite like this. Now, I can only imagine the number of COVID analogies being made in commencement speeches on campuses everywhere around the country today. But I'm not here to talk so much about making the best of a bad situation. Because there, there have been many lessons learned. And I must say that with each passing day, I actually become more optimistic about our future. And my source of hope for the future is really the degree to which business, and more importantly, each of you as business leaders 
can be a preeminent force for good in our society. You know, one of the things I've always tried to be as a CEO and as a leader is what I call a realistic optimist. And to me, that means you've got to confront challenges with clear eyes, but you've also got to create a vision and really a reason to believe in the future. And with this in mind, I believe that our imperfect system of global capitalism, it truly is the greatest engine of human prosperity that the world has ever known. And the business leaders, more and more, are increasingly stepping up to the plate to drive positive change on a global scale. I mean, consider how much has changed. Business leaders today, they're now accountable to a wide array of stakeholders. And it's really become a moral and financial imperative to ensure that purpose, that purpose is infused across everything that we do in business. Now, I've had the unique privilege of working at J&J for more than 30 years. And it's a company that was shaped by our commitment to our credo, and it was a statement of corporate purpose that tells us that the greatest responsibility is to all the stakeholders that we serve. And that fair profit, well, it doesn't have to come at the cost of other obligations. And I think your past two years at Wharton gave you an accelerated view of just how foundational that concept of purpose really is. And as true natives to this new way of doing business, well, your biggest task is going to be twofold. First, continuously demonstrating that purpose and profit, that they're really not in opposition. And that business leaders, you can use your position to positively impact society and the world. And so look, I believe that there's a few lessons, however, that are really going to be foundational to navigating a radically new future of work and business that you're going to be entering to really help make the world and business a better place for all. Lesson number one, it's really about embracing technology, and it's the best way to stay relevant and drive change. And I can tell you, after just spending a week being out in California, visiting our digital robotics team, doing an Apple board meeting, that your knowledge, your embracing, your understanding of technology is likely going to be more important to your future than ever. And I know you spent a lot of time for the last few years learning IRR, NPV, WAC, and ROIC, but I submit that as important or maybe more, more important going forward is your ability to understand technology and innovation. Tools like cloud, edge, AI, ML, data science or qubits. These things are gonna fundamentally change so many aspects, not only of business, but of society. Now, please understand, I don't think you've learned all those lessons in finance in vain, but I do challenge you to consider how you're gonna translate these skills into new ways of thinking, working, and executing in a hyper-digitalized world. Now, I've been fortunate to have led J&J &J during a decade long that it really accomplished pretty amazing advancements in human health, from unlocking the human genetic code, development of cell therapies, data sciences, drug discovery. We've also experienced a huge shift in the way we work. We innovate and advance digital technologies. So I really think it's a pretty fundamentally different world, and there's no going back. But the good news is the hard-won insights from this experience that you learned here at Wharton, I really think it can propel you to create even more innovation for everyone that you serve going forward. And none of that would have been possible without decades and billions of dollars of investment, research, trial and error, mistakes and failures and starts. I think one of your other jobs as a business leader is making sure that you invest in the future, in innovation, in everything that you do, regardless of where you work. I truly believe, I think this offers our best chance to raise the living standard around the world. And we can better live in peace, address climate change, help people live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Simply put, I think we as business leaders have got to be a catalyst for change and innovation, provide those resources, and make sure that we're part of that job. Next, stay competitive, but collaboration and partnership are gonna be a big shape of the future. I think all of us believe the competitive nature of capitalism, well, it's at the very core 
of its benefit to society, whether in families, in schools, in sports. All of us have been in some Darwinian struggle that made us dig deeper than we thought possible. And I've seen firsthand that sense, how that sense of innovation builds urgency and pride, and it can foster it within the industries and companies and teams. But I can also tell you, in no uncertain terms, that after being in healthcare for more than 30 years, the amount of collaboration that took place between academia, the government, NGOs, corporations, in response to the pandemic, was truly unprecedented. And I'd like to believe that we could apply this going forward and work across other industries, whether it's biotech, fintech, education, the environment, infrastructure, transportation, or even just the way we live together, for us to truly tackle the world's most challenging issues, I think collaboration is going to be more important than ever. And we've got to remember that this collaboration has got to be done with diversity and inclusion at its very core. Because when you have diversity of people and perspectives, it's always going to propel you to a greater outcome. And as leaders, the task ahead for you is continuing widening that sense of boundless possibility and shared mission. Lesson number three, and this was a big one for me over the last two and a half years, is that guess what? Stuff happens that you can't control. And you're going to need a lot of grit to survive and thrive. As you graduate and begin this next chapter, you should do so with clear, steely eyes about the environment ahead. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that the rate and pace and magnitude of dynamics and events outside of your control, I think they're going to only accelerate even more. From the various earliest days of the pandemic, we all had to operate in an environment of unpredictability and upheaval. Never had we seen a biological threat that so completely upended how we approached making decisions when you consider it, they had an enormous economic, societal, and public health consequences. It seemed like every time we had managed to predict something accurately, guess what? Something else happened, and we got surprised. We faced twists and turns, and eventually it became hard to be rattled by disappointment or be too excited about breakthroughs. I think in some ways, it turned out to be a good thing. This is Winston Churchill once said when asked how Britain was able to keep fighting in World War II while facing such a profound existential threat from Nazi Germany. His line was, well, you know what? Sometimes you just got to keep boogering on. And I would say, remember that. Grit and tenacity count for a lot in this world. And the pandemic reminded us that often things don't go as planned, that the spotlight's going to be on you. And at the exact moment when you're going to be under a lot of stress, and there will times be times when the odds against you feel insurmountable and when you know all it to be true and you're still able to dig deep, rally your team, get the job done, well, there is no better feeling in the world. And I think each of you really had a chance to learn a lot of that early in your careers than most, and I hope that that gives you the confidence to tackle the unexpected in the years to come. So my last and final lesson is nothing and I believe nothing, this certainly we've learned over the last two years, is more important than good health. It's just so essential to who we are. Making up nearly 20% of our economy, one out of every eight jobs, health care and public health policy, well, they're foundational to the world, for society, for families, and for individuals. Look, every business, political, academic, and organizational leader had to become a health care expert during the pandemic. Even if you never thought about incidence rates, PCR, antigen testing, endofiltration, you had to learn it. We had to consider the health of our employees, customers we service, our communities, our very own families. In this moment, it also put a huge spotlight on the everyday bravery and heroism of essential workers, healthcare workers, nurses, teachers, parents, caregivers, and so many others. Now, I hope this interest and this empathy and care continues long after this crisis is over. And very importantly, as future business leaders, you need to consider the importance of managing your own health for your future career. So I'd encourage you to find those daily rituals regarding movement, energy, how you sleep, what you consume, how you relax, and the time and effort to take care of yourself so that ultimately you can make an impact and take care of others. 
Remember, the days are long, but the years are going to sh be short and go really fast. And making daily investments in your own health is going to pay big dividends for the future. So I have, I have to say, I've got one final source of optimism for the future. And that is each one of you sitting out there in the audience today. As you go out into the world, you leave with powerful leadership acumen from the best business school in the world. But you also leave Wharton with critical and hard-won real-world lessons about thriving in an utterly transformed business landscape and a new set of expectations for what businesses must accomplish to make the world a better place for all humankind. Now, I know the challenges ahead, they're going to be marked by a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity, but I have never, never been more confident in a generation of leaders, and I can't wait to see the incredible things you go on to accomplish. So lead with passion, lead with your values, lead with purpose. Godspeed and good luck.